They're calling it the most ambitious plan in the province's history to get Ontario to net zero emissions. The NDP recently unveiled its so-called Green New Democratic Deal. Yes, it's no doubt a takeoff on U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal of the Depression era and today's Green New Deal, proposed by U.S. Democrats such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The NDP feels this plan is a ticket to a cleaner Ontario and perhaps an election victory next year. Joining us to put this Green New Democratic Deal under the microscope, we welcome, in Sarasota, Florida, Bruce Party, professor of law at Queen's University and senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. In Brooklyn, Ontario, which is just near Oshawa, Sarah Petrovan, director of policy at Clean Energy Canada. And in the west end of the provincial capital, Angela Bischoff, director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. And it's great to have you three on the program tonight. Just before we get your views on this, um, I'm not going to assume that everybody has heard about it, so let's go through a bit of a point form here with some of the highlights of this plan. And Sheldon, I'll ask you if you would to bring the graphics up and let's go through it point by point. The NDP would propose to implement Ontario's first ever comprehensive zero emissions vehicles strategy and support the move to eliminate internal combustion engine vehicles by the year 2035. They would offer incentives to Ontarians who purchase these zero emissions vehicles. They would give $600 for households to install EV charging stations at homes and require new homes to have vehicle charging capacity. They would retrofit existing buildings to be more energy efficient and ensure that all new buildings are as energy efficient as possible. The NDP says this would create 100,000 jobs over eight years as part of the retrofit program alone. They would electrify the GO train network along an accelerated timeline to replace dirty diesel trains along all lines. There would be no expansion of Ontario's nuclear capacity until cost and waste storage issues are resolved. The cost of all this, they estimate at $40 billion, and they would pay for it this way. They would reintroduce to Ontario a cap-and-trade program, which would bring in $30 billion a year, and then sell green bonds for the rest to the tune of $10 billion. That's the Green New Democratic Deal, as outlined recently by Ontario's official opposition. Now, this is a, a very comprehensive plan. We've only put some of the highlights there. There's a lot more to it than that. Generally speaking, just before we go deep on this, um, Sarah, start us off here. General thoughts on what the NDP is trying to propose. It's a good climate plan. I mean, you know, we've been doing climate planning in globally now for a number of years. And, you know, the conversation has advanced significantly since we started talking about this, Steve, five years ago. It checks all the boxes. It deals with Ontario's major sources of emissions, which are buildings, transportation, heavy industry. It does, frankly, the level of effort that needs to get done. Bruce, your view. Uh, nonsense on stilts, as Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham once said. This is uh, describing the NDP's version of a socialist utopia that would actually be a nightmare. In a way, it's I think the NDP's um, attempt to transition us from a COVID emergency to a permanent climate emergency. Uh, it reads like it's been put together on the back of an envelope. It's not well costed. You know it's going to cost more than $40 billion. It's, um, it's a little crazy. Uh, I'm going to infer from that that you disagree with uh, Sarah. Just, just, just a tad. Just a tad. Gotcha. Okay. Angela, would you weigh in on this, please? I think it's a very strong climate plan. It calls for the phase-out of Ontario's gas-fired power plants. Uh, in stark contrast to Doug Ford's plan of ramping up gas 500%, it calls for more wind and solar power. It calls for more water power imports from Quebec and more conservation. And uh, it's just taking us in a different direction than the existing uh, Ford government plan, which is more nuclear and gas and less renewables and conservation. Let's ask the key question, though, Angela, which is, will it achieve what it sets out to achieve? What it wants to do is get Ontario to net zero emissions in 30 years. With this plan, is that doable? Well, we could get to net zero emissions in the electricity sector by 2030 just by phasing out our gas-fired power plants. That could meet all of our climate objectives in this province. And we could easily replace them with low-cost wind, water, solar, and conservation. So, yes, we can do this. 
Bruce, I know you're not a fan, but if this were to happen, will it actually get us to net zero by 2050? Okay, first question is what they mean by net zero. I mean, net means removing as much carbon as you put into that to the atmosphere. Right. And it is probable that Canada, and for that matter, Ontario, is already net zero in the sense that we have a lot of land cover with a lot of forests, and those forests probably absorb more carbon than the whole country puts out already. So we already have a problem in terms of defining exactly what the goal is. They have all kinds of ambitious uh, plans to reduce carbon emissions. So maybe that's not what they mean by net zero, but the term's not well defined. So who knows? Sarah, you had a very quizzical look on your face there as Bruce was outlining what he thought net zero meant. Uh, I, I won't draw any inferences. What did you mean by it? I mean, you know, is it possible for the NDP plan to get to net zero emissions? Yes. Are we at net zero emissions now? Absolutely not. If we were at net zero emissions now, there would be no need for international action. There would be no need for action in Ontario. And really, you know, what the NDP is proposing is putting Ontario on a level playing field with where the rest of the world is going, where Ontario's largest trading partners are going, where Canada's largest trading partners are going. Like, let's be clear, this is no longer an environmental imperative. It's an economic one. All right. Let's follow up with this then, Sarah. The, the I guess the, the foundation for this plan, the thing that's going to pay for it, is reintroducing cap and trade. We had cap and trade in Ontario under the previous Kathleen Wynne government. When the Liberals fell, Doug Ford came in, cancelled it. Now the NDP say they want to put it back in. Is it a good idea to try to do that? Sure. You need, you need carbon pricing to send an economic signal. Even the Fraser Institute agrees that it is the most efficient way of reducing emissions. And so, you know, it's important to have carbon pricing as the backbone of any uh, climate plan. Bruce, is that right? You'd be okay with a return to the cap and trade plan? No, no, I wouldn't. Now, I'm not endorsing a carbon tax. I think that's crazy. But if you're going to go down that road, a carbon tax is probably the best way to do it because it's transparent. A cap and trade system is inherently political. Uh, you're going to scare off all your industry and your investment. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that you will get the kind of tax revenue that they're expecting. And of course, the costs will be more than they are planning. So all in all, even on their own terms, I think it's a bad plan. Angela, the idea of returning to a cap and trade plan, the likes of which we had in the province uh, two and a half years ago or more. Uh, what's your view on that? We support a rising price on carbon because it's an effective and powerful tool to reducing greenhouse gas pollution. Where there are pros and cons to the cap and trade versus, versus other options, uh, carbon tax, whether the revenues are returned to individuals or to government to fund greenhouse gas pollution reduction programs, uh, both will uh, reduce climate pollution and both will create a rise on pricing. And we, we, could, uh, we would support either because we support carbon pricing. Angela, let me follow up with this. I wonder whether the markets would say Province of Ontario, you had a cap and trade system under the Liberals, then the Conservatives came in and cancelled it. If the NDP get in, they're going to bring it back. Who knows, maybe the next government would cancel it. Why don't you guys get your act together? Why would the, uh, why would the private sector not just say, we're not going to do business with Ontario because this is just too nutty? Because the private sector is also asking for carbon pricing. They recognize this is the way the future is going around the world. Uh, uh, countries around the world are phasing out fossil fuels and moving to a renewable future. And uh, uh, industry recognizes this. So they're asking for carbon pricing. Bruce, what's your view on that? It's true that uh, some industry are sort of climbing on a bandwagon. But in general, when companies make their own self-interested decisions, which they should do, they try to avoid extra costs that provide no extra revenue. And cap and trade is one of those things. Uh, if, if Ontario produces an environment in which the energy policy is unstable, which it has been over a period of time, then I suspect that that will not produce the kind of environment that will encourage companies to both invest and stick around. Sarah, I gather we've been having some difficulty with your line to Brooklyn, but we've got you back now. So can I get you to weigh in on the main point here, which was 
Uh, when cap and trade was in place in Ontario under the Liberals before 2018, it did certainly bring billions of dollars into the Treasury to be spent on green programs. The question is whether it made the air any cleaner in Ontario. What can you tell us on that? So the thing about cap and trade is it re its environmental integrity relies on where you set the cap. So you are not allowed to emit beyond what the cap is set at. And so in many ways, it provides much more certainty in terms of GHG reductions than other forms of carbon pricing systems, although each system all has its pros and its cons. So if you can set the cap at a reasonable amount in line with the emissions that you need to reduce and model out how that works with the complementary policies you put in place, you know, things like to reduce uh, emissions in the transportation and the building sector, which this plan also talks about, you can get reasonable, real GHG reductions from a cap and trade system. Okay. I want to move on and talk about what, um, what may be one of the most interesting parts of this new deal uh, by the NDP, and that is the New Democrats' position on nuclear. We know in the past that the NDP has always been very anti-nuclear energy. Having said that, they are not pledging to get us out of the nuclear power generation business in Ontario. What they've said is status quo until we can make sure that we've got some way to deal with the spent fuel rods and nuclear waste, et cetera, et cetera. I find that a pretty interesting position. Angela, what's your take on that? Well, I think they're they're positioning positioning themselves to uh, be opposed to new nuclear power in the province. Be and uh, so that means no to new SMRs and small and modular reactors. On, thank you, and that's based on their commitment to affordable power and equity. Um, but I don't think they go quite far enough. The Green Party of Ontario, for example, also calls out for a moratorium on the rebuilding of the existing nuclear power reactors, which is a $26 billion program that the Ford government is, is embarking on by rebuilding Darlington and Bruce. So I think that uh, the NDP is going in the, the right direction by questioning the costs of nuclear power and, uh, and the c concerns about waste. Bruce, what's your view on the New Democrats' apparent new position not to get us out of the nuclear power business? I suspect that they find themselves painted into a corner. Uh, our hydro resources are basically tapped out. There's probably no new places to, to, to do hydro. If they are dead set against building new uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants, uh, keep in mind that the renewables, that is wind and solar, don't actually help you build base load. So they're not really a solution. For every solar farm or wind farm that you build, you need other dependable sources to kick in when the wind stops blowing or the sun stops shining. And nuclear can do that and, and, um, and uh, gas powered can do that. But if you're choosing between those two things, it might be that the NDP is realizing that in order to maintain this, this carbon emission platform, they're going to have to settle for nuclear. Yeah, Sarah, that's the key question. Do you think the NDP have come to the realization that you just simply can't keep the lights on in the province of Ontario, which depends on nuclear power for more than half its electricity generation, if you don't have nuclear as part of the mix? You need to have a non-emitting source of baseload power. Nuclear power has a lot of challenges with it. Cost is one of them. Waste is one of it. You know, we don't have an answer to deal with nuclear waste in this province. We can't find a willing host community. But, you know, there are other options. It would involve uh, inner ties and building transmission with uh, provinces neighboring us that do have an abundance of hydro resources, namely Quebec and Manitoba. So it's feasible to assume that at some point down the road, you may be able to replace nuclear power, but it's not a reality right now. So I think what the NDP is recognizing is that, okay, at least as it is now, it is a non-emitting source. That is, nukes, when they're up and running, do not emit GHGs. But I think they've also left the door open to the future to other technologies and other clean energy solutions including, you know, importing clean electricity from other neighboring provinces and also looking at things such as energy storage, which does deal with the intermittency of renewables. I want to be super clear on this, though, Sarah. Are you saying that if we build transmission lines to the hydroelectric plants in Quebec 
or in Manitoba, that that could provide the province of Ontario with enough baseload electricity to get by on renewables and no nukes? I don't know. To be honest with you, Steve, I don't want to say 100% yes, because I don't know how much power we could feasibly import and how much everybody has to export. But it, it, should, it could certainly replace a big chunk of our baseload power. Angela, where are you on that? The IESO has done numerous studies claiming that That's, we could import... Angela, we're, we're in an, an acronym-free zone here. So you're talking about the independent electricity system operator. Thank you. Uh, that we I, we have the grid between Quebec and Ontario already, and we could triple imports already with existing transmission infrastructure, importing enough water power from Quebec, and they have the surplus to replace even all of our gas at present. But we could also import much more by upgrading the transmission lines between the two provinces. And the IESO is, has identified three or four very low cost uh, options for increasing uh, the imports of water power from Quebec dramatically. And yes, with a combination of water power from Quebec, wind and solar in Ontario, and conservation, we could replace our nuclear and our gas-fired power plants. And I'd just like to add as well that um, Quebec's hydro reservoirs can act as a giant battery. So by integrating Ontario's wind and solar power with Quebec's hydro reservoirs, we can convert our intermittent wind and solar into a 24-7 source of, of electricity supply. At what cost? At very low cost. Quebec has been offering us for years water power from Quebec at just five cents a kilowatt hour. That is a third of the price of building new nuclear reactors in Ontario or of even half the price of, of rebuilding our eight our uh, aging reactors. So it's very low cost, it's renewable power, and we've got the grid between the provinces. And there's no opposition to the existing water power uh, uh, supply in, in Quebec. So it, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Well, it's low cost for the electricity itself, but you've got to build the transmission network to get it here. That would presumably cost several billions upon billions of dollars, would it not? No, the ISO has identified three transmission grid upgrades. One is $80 million, one is $280 million, and one is just over a billion dollars. That's to import 6,000 megawatts, which is more than the Darlington reactor for ex uh, station, for example, which OPG says will cost $13 billion. So it's very low cost in comparison to nuclear power. Bruce, what's your view on this? Well, I think we need to get some perspective here. We're talking about longer term plans. I mean, right now, Ontario has more power than it needs. And the NDP is not learning from the lessons that the Liberals taught us when they put all the plans for all these renewable projects in place. Those renewable projects, the the the, the, the tariffs and so on, the feed-in tariffs pro programs have caused power bills for Ontario residents to skyrocket. And while in this plan, the NDP is pretending to want to look out for the little guy, it was those energy policies that created one of the main problems right now for affordability in Ontario. And yet they're going down the same road in terms of dictating what technology should be used and when it should be done and exercising managerial control over the sector. And that that is ignoring the lesson. Right now, we have more power than we need. We have to offload it onto, onto other jurisdictions and, and people are paying enormous amounts for their power. And e e even though power now is, as was pointed out, is not that expensive to produce. Okay, I know we could talk more about this, but I do want to cover off some of the other aspects of the plan as well. Talking about energy efficient buildings. And again, I don't know how many of these numbers we have to take with a grain of salt, so I'm, I'm going to ask all of you because you're the experts. But the NDP does say in its Green New Democratic deal that by investing in retrofits between the years 2022 and 2030, Ontario could see more than $15.2 billion added to our annual GDP the value of the goods and services produced in our economy, which should create about 100,000 good jobs. 15.2 billion leading to 100,000 new good jobs. Question, Sarah, do those numbers sound reasonable? 
I mean, they could they could be reasonable. Energy efficiency uh, is a huge job creator. It also, uh, you know, you can reduce GHG emissions with it. And more importantly, you can help businesses and residents save money on their on their energy bills. Um, so, you know, it is entirely feasible that you could see that level of economic benefit. I mean, it's important to reduce GHGs in our buildings. It's, you know, Ontario's uh, third largest source of emissions. And so it's wise that they named uh, and retrofit an energy efficiency program in their climate plan. Angela, I think every party at some point rolls out the let's retrofit our buildings and make them more energy efficient, use better insulation and yada, yada, yada. The question is, is there really that much to be had by doing all of those things? There's no question. We've only uh, touched the surface of our energy efficiency potential, and it's our lowest cost option to reducing electrical demand. It saves homeowners money, and it reduces greenhouse gas pollution, and it reduces the outflow of Ontario dollars to Western Canada or to Pennsylvania to buy fracked gas. So there's, there's so much more that can be done, especially once we reach economies of scale, it just becomes so much lower lower cost. Bruce? Uh, another instance of fairy tale economics. You know, you, you bring in more tax revenue, you increase your spending, you create these jobs, and you produce an economic utopia. That's not the way it works. You're, you, the, the, the more control and the more influence and the more direction <laughs> government has over the economy, the less your, con your economy is going to strive. So this idea that you're going to produce these many jobs uh, effortlessly by increasing taxes, by putting in the cap and trade program again, that uh, just, it just doesn't measure up. And again, here we're talking about reducing electricity use, which, as we pointed out, is mostly produced in Ontario today from non-carbon emission sources. So all of the effort, all the taxes, all the spending is being directed at, at something that's not even consistent with the plan's own premise. Well, let me introduce now uh, an idea as part of this green plan that would increase, presumably dramatically, electricity use. And that is the notion that within 15 years' time, there will be no more internal combustion engines being sold in the province of Ontario. Um, I want to read something here from the Financial Post that Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the sort of skeptical environmentalist, wrote in 2020 about electric cars taking over the market. Here's what he said. Though technological innovation will eventually make electric cars economical even without subsidies, concerns over range and slow recharging will remain. That is why most scientific prognoses show that electric cars will increase in sales but not take over the world. A new study shows that by the year 2030, just 13% of new cars will be battery electric. Governments that ban new fossil fuel cars would essentially be forbidding 87% of consumers from buying the cars they want. It's hard to imagine that could be politically viable. Okay, we have two very, Sarah, very dramatic uh, differences of opinion here. On the one hand, Lomborg saying, you just can't get there from here, and the NDP saying, oh no, we're getting there from here. How's this gonna work? Well, the thing is, is that it's really just not the NDP that's saying this. What the NDP is doing is they're really just reflecting where the rest of the world is going. You have major automakers, right? We build GM cars here in Canada. GM is saying that by 2035, they are no longer selling internal combustion engines. You see similar, uh, you know, commitments from Land Rover, Jaguar, Cadillac, Volkswagen, you know, Ford Motor Company is saying that by 100% of their cars in Europe are going to be electric by 2030. So really, you know, they're just reflecting a commitment of where auto manufacturers are going, where other countries are going, and where the rest of the world is going. And that's wise, given that, you know, auto manufacturing is a huge... Uh, economic driver for Ontario. It's our major. It's our major export. And so, in some ways, you know, if Ontario doesn't put policy in place to put us in uh, in line with where the rest of the world is going, we're going to miss out. And I think that's what the NDP is starting to recognize in this report. Angela, if that's true, again, we're talking future, so who knows? But if that's true, and that's the way it rolls out, and suddenly we have a society whereby millions upon millions of people are plugging in their electric vehicles into their new home recharging stations every single night, do we have the electricity generation possibility to handle that kind of new load? Well, as Bruce mentioned, we do at 
uh, the current uh, time have surplus power. And we're saying we should be closing some of the nuclear stations because we have so much surplus power. But uh, again, a, a study done for the independent electricity system operator, the IESO, said that one million electric vehicles on the Ontario added to Ontario would only increase uh, demand by two percent. So and having all the passenger vehicles in the province would increase demand by 17 percent and we think we could meet that increased demand through conservation efforts uh wind and water solar power etc you know um the previous government in the last decade reduced demand in the province by 10 percent and that was really just through uh investing in the low-hanging conservation fruit. There's so much more potential to reduce demand dramatically that, yes, we can handle the increase in uh, uh, in electricity required by electric vehicles. But also keep in mind that uh, electric vehicles are, uh, are parked 90% of the day and they can uh, put their power back into the grid during the high peaks and take the power out at nighttime when we have low peaks. So they can act as a storage option as well. Bruce, I'm down to my last 40 seconds. Let me give it to you in answering the question on whether you think it's advisable for all new homes, all new apartments, all new condos to have to, by law, put in EV charging stations. No, because you're making consumers' choices for them in the same way you're talking as they are with the electric vehicles. The electric vehicles and the charging stations are only viable if the government subsidizes them. That tells you that consumers are not buying them on their own. The reasons that car manufacturers and so on are in favor of all this is because of the money. They're making money on electric vehicles because governments are, are footing the bill. If you get government out of it, you'll find out what people actually want. And what they want is not electric vehicles that have a limited range and a long recharging time. The technology is not ready for, for the big time. The percentage of electric cars is still very, very small, as Bjorn points out. This is government choosing technology, which is not the way it's supposed to work. It never does. As we often say on this program, to be continued. Uh, we thank Bruce Party and Sarah Petrovan and Angela Bischoff for their... I guess, first rendering on the Green New Democratic Deal. More to come in the months and days ahead, no doubt. Thanks, you three. Thanks, dude. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario and by viewers like you. Thank you.